Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to Coffee with Craig, where we talk about all things firearms, firearms policy, politics, culture, media, you name it. We're talking about it right here on Coffee with Craig. So please take a moment, like, and share the program so your friends can join in the conversation right now. Also, please take a moment, subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Facebook so that you can get alerted as soon as we go live. Now, by the way, just to make sure you do that, make sure you hit the notification button in both cases. Also, visit us at fpcgear.com. That's fpcgear.com. Cool place to go to find all sorts of pro 2A swag. Uh, and know that every dollar that you spend will go right back into the fight for a right to keep and bear arms. It's that simple. You can support the Second Amendment. You can look good doing it. That's fpcgear.com. All right, let's get into today's topic. Now, we all know that the Second Amendment is really kind of the, the red-headed stepchild of, of constitutional rights. We all know that it's not given the same credibility or, or the same value as the right to free speech or, or the, right, uh, the right to vote or, or even the, you know, the right to not be offended or health care, as, as many would like us to try and believe uh, that they are rights. Uh, but we all know that the right to keep and bear arms is treated like a redhead stepchild, like it's not treated as fairly as the rest of the rights. In fact, even in the courts, when they evaluate cases dealing with the Second Amendment, uh, they have different levels of scrutiny, right? For things like free speech, they have what's called strict love, strict scrutiny, meaning the law, it is what it says. You, you cannot take away or get in way of, of this fundamental right right this right to free speech and if you do well hey it better be pretty darn good reason why well when it comes to a lot of second amendment cases in fact most that i've seen it's what's called rational basis rational basis being if there's any rational reason why someone would want to pass a law to infringe on this right well then they can and the scary part about it is is that the person that's defending it the people who came up with the law don't even necessarily have to be the ones to come up with the rational basis. I've seen where judges have come out of nowhere, come up with some cockamamie idea as to, well, this sounds rational. This is the reason why I'm going to make this law okay. Well, there was a conversation that took place recently in, uh, in the House of Representatives and it had to do with voter rights, uh, specifically had to do with the Voting Rights Act and how, it, how there were certain laws that were in place that were negatively impacting some voters in this case minorities but negatively impacting some voters and were overly burdensome and thus uh infringing on their fundamental right uh to vote in this case so and you know i wanted you guys to hear this conversation because i think you're going to recognize that it sounds eerily familiar check it out i want to give you all uh, or as many of you as you can a chance to answer this but could you summarize some of the uh, requirements the the, the identification requirements, the things that seem reasonable at first, but then tend to disenfranchise voters when they register or try to vote. Could you give me a brief summary of, of what some of those things are? Um, I'd be delighted. Um, and of course, it's a very state-specific inquiry because different Correct. communities in the state- Some of these are proposed maybe, and some of them are in place already in states. But. Well, but also the communities are different and right. they will have different needs and different access. But one of the things that make us provide a further study and inquiry is whether or not it's a very limited list of identification, whether or not it has to be government issued and who that government uh, can be. Um, it is whether or not there is an alternative for folks who are eligible but are uh, that don't have that kind of identification and how uh, accessible is that alternative. And uh, the other measure is what other measures are in place. Is this a redundant barrier? Some of the challenges that we are seeing with these laws is that at every step in the process, there is a barrier that is hard for some people to overcome and when you have these what, what type of barriers so let's let's take a situation um in a state that has uh, a restriction on a voter registration group right uh you have people that are not eligible to vote uh i'm sorry you have people that are not voting uh, a community wants to go in and register them but can't because they can get hit with fines if they don't do everything perfect or they have to uh, go through some training by some petty bureaucrat so you have one barrier to getting on the ballot that way training 
would you would be opposed to having some kind of training? No, but the specific, the I think there's training, but then there's a requirement for training that is uh, onerous and inaccessible. Like some of the things that are concerning folks in Tennessee, like some of the things that were underlying some of the concerns we had in the Florida case that Dale mentioned earlier. Let, let me give Dale a chance to answer. Uh, sorry, Mr. Ho and uh, Ms. Chapman, uh, Mr. Ho. Um, sure. So I think an example of a law that might sound um, harmless to some people, but when it operates in practice is quite devastating for voter registration is one that I mentioned in my opening remarks, a law um, that Kansas had that required people to show a birth certificate or a passport when registering to vote in order to establish that they're United States um, citizens. Um, don't take it from me, take it from the United States Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit, which in a unanimous opinion in 2016 by Judge Jerome Holmes, who was appointed by President George W. Bush, um, found that the law had caused a mass denial of a fundamental constitutional right. The court's mass, words, mass not mine. Mass denial of a fundamental constitutional right. Correct. Ms. Because, Chapman, could you give me an, an example? Or? Sure. I wanted to talk from personal experience, having been a voting rights advocate um, on the ground in states. Um, I worked in Wisconsin um, along with- Can you do it in about 30 seconds? Sure. Yeah. Um, I actually met a woman who was 90 years old. She was born in Mississippi at home to a midwife, and she did not have um, the ability to get um, a voter ID that was required by the state because she never had a birth certificate. And her act her daughter actually had to spend over $2,000 in legal fees in order for her to obtain those types of documents. She okay, so what we're talking about here, once again, is the fundamental right, a fundamental constitutional right that is being infringed on by overly burdensome government requirements. Now, I, I can't, you can't say that's the case in every place in the United States, but there are definitely some places in the United States where just owning a firearm, just exercise, to be able to exercise the right to possess a firearm, own a firearm, purchase a firearm, is incredibly onerous. You have places like New York and New Jersey where literally you can wait years to get a permit to have a firearm in your home wait years because the information and the things that they require are so onerous and that's not even including the right to carry a firearm the right to possess a firearm outside of your home so now you guys can kind of see where he's going here you heard the talk about training right you guys heard that piece right so Here's kind of where he was going, and I think you guys are going to, I think you guys already know this. He's basically pointing to the fact that in many of these cases, these individuals are passed, these very same people are passing these laws that are infringing on a right that, that are infringing on rights that they don't care about, but they don't care that there are even less, less restrictive things. They want to remove even less restrictive things on rights that they do care about. Check it out. So, would you say that these disproportionately disenfranchised minorities? Yes, disproportionately yes. disenfranchised what, what people of color. Mysteries? I would say that people that have, yes, because people that are more on the margins, that have lives that are more complicated, that um, are unable to overcome these barriers, right. which because of poverty and other systems are likely to fall. Okay, more let, me, let me tell you something and ask you a question. Everything you've given me is a requirement to purchase a gun. So all of the requirements that you say disenfranchise minorities from uh, and give them mass denial of a fundamental constitutional right are in place in many states, in some states, to purchase a gun or to carry a gun. How would it not also disenfranchise minorities to have these requirements to purchase or carry a firearm? Ms. Perez. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not understanding the question. Do you mind All of the it? requirements that you say to vote mm -hmm. that disenfranchise disproportionately minorities are requirements in one state or another to purchase or carry a firearm. How does that not disenfranchise people of their Second Amendment constitutional right as well? Um, or would, I, wouldn't you agree with me that it does? I, I think this is not uh, the kind this, of setting or time to be able to discuss this. All right, I, I mean, think I appreciate you helping me to make my point. I would like to submit two, uh, two documents to the record, for the record, as you knew, as consent. The first one is Presentation to Presidential Advisory Commission on Election Integrity, a Suggestion and Some Evidence by John R. Lott, Jr., Crime Prevention Research Center.org. And then another one is a Chicago Tribune article by the same author, John R. Lott, Commentary, Apply Background Checks for Gun Purchases to Voting. 
In other words, this is a document about what would happen if we use the NICS background check, which which does check on whether you're an uh, illegal immigrant, non-immigrant visa, or has renounced citizenship, uh, which has been highly lauded by Democrats as a way to vet people to exercise their constitutional right. Yes, Let's indeed. those to the record. But without any objection, and I look forward to reading those, and I, I take it from the, the gentleman's questioning that you uh, agree with the witnesses, at least these three witnesses, that these are uh, unlawfully burdensome restrictions that are being uh, imposed on the right to vote. I, I agree that they are the same restriction on the Second Amendment as they are on the right to vote, which in the Second Amendment is a constitutional right, which is enumerated in the Constitution. Right. Thank you. Okay, so I'll start with this. Um, first of all, the idea that if you are a minority, that you are on the margins, that you live a more complicated life is about as racist a statement as one can get. But then again, that's pretty much what we expect from, you know, th those who claim to be about progressivism and, you know, op open-mindedness and, and, and acceptance and tolerance. But we all know that's not what they're about. Now, all that aside, I want you to think about this. Think about, like he said, well, what about like the Knicks check? What if we applied the Knicks check to your ability to vote? We already know, at least we know how many false positives come up uh, on, in the Knicks background check. We already know, imagine people being able to be added to the Knicks check that we, don't, we have absolutely no idea uh, how they got on or how they got off. Like right now you have, you have individual states that want to say if you're on a, if you're on any sort of a government list like a no-fly list you should be you should be added you should not be able to buy a gun well guess what that would mean that then you would be added to nicks that or at least that state particular state would add you to nicks which would mean that you're prohibited from being able to purchase a firearm i mean it's just funny to me that 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 even in this conversation she's like well this isn't the time or the place what do you mean this isn't the time or the place you're talking about burdensome laws that take away or then fringe on fundamental constitutional rights. Well, that's what we're talking about here. I, either they're onerous or they're not. Either they negatively or, or disproportionately impact minorities or they don't. So make up your mind or do, or is it that you, you only want to protect minorities rights in some cases, but in other cases, well, we have to make sure that those people don't get guns. Because that's, we, you all know that is pretty much what most gun control has been about, about making sure that those people don't have access to firearms. But anyway, I just thought it was a great conversation. I thought uh, that Representative Thomas Massey did a fantastic job of making his point. And the point, quite frankly, is this, is that the right to keep and bear arms is a fundamental right and that it ought to be protected and that it ought to be respected the way in which other constitutional rights are. And that if, if things are being put in place that are too onerous to allow citizens to be able to exercise it, when well, those amount to infringements and ought not be, ought not be legal and uh, are not constitutional. All right, folks, that's going to be it for today's Coffee with Craig. We very much appreciate you guys tuning in. We appreciate you liking and sharing the program and telling your friends about the Firearms Policy Coalition. Because, well, as we like to say, we are the home in the fight for civil rights. Got to use them or you're going to lose them. You guys take care. If you like our videos, follow, subscribe, like, and share.